Hello. Awesome. Hi. Hey. Hi, Martin. How's it going? Yeah, going well. How are you doing? Thank you for coming. And thank you guys all for coming. Um, quick introduction. We are BAF, Block Acceleration Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization focused on accelerating blockchain. We uh, create content. We try to start accredited courses at universities. Uh, we built curriculum. We all, we're also right now working on uh, club acceleration, uh, blockchain club acceleration, and we have many events and meetups uh, every week. And then we're also working on hackathons. We're actually working on a collaborating on a big hackathon coming up with uh, Near, which is called the Meta Build Hackathon. It's coming up this Friday, so join the hackathon if you want to help build the open web and the prize pool is actually one million dollars so you'll have the opportunity to develop the metaverse with the best of the web3 community and there are also workshops go going on for two weeks so be sure to join if you like launching new projects and completing challenges and finding awesome teammates um so yeah i'll drop the link in the chat i just wanted to quickly introduce Beth and tell you guys about this awesome hackathon coming up so make sure to join that and now uh, we can, I'll pass it on to you, Martin, to let you introduce yourself to our members and what what do you have to teach us today? Yeah, for sure. Um, so first off, you know, thank you for for letting me, me join uh, your, your group here and, and present. Um, I know I met yourself and I also met uh, some of the other members of BAF through um, just the general developer community. So it's, it's really great what you guys um, are doing and and um, bringing people like myself to kind of show what I'm working on. I'm going yeah. to definitely use this as a feedback experience for sure, but maybe if people learn something, that'd be great too. Um, and uh, I'm pretty excited. But yeah, just a little bit of my background. So I, I actually um, don't come from the traditional web development or blockchain development background. Um, I went to school, undergrad, studied molecular microbiology, worked in a lab for a little bit. What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so to totally different world than what I'm I'm doing now. Um, but I, you know, I think I learned some some valuable like skills like analytical thinking and, and things like that um, in in those in those years. And then when I graduated, I basically somehow went into uh, I I went into the Peace Corps and then somehow found myself in finance, and then found blockchain and started mining and building my own mining rig and stuff. And then got more and more interested in deep diving into the the application and smart contract world, which is where I am now. So there's a lot of like things in there, but that was like a very small cliff notes journey of. of, of All yeah. right. So it was mostly self-taught. I would say, yeah, self-taught for sure. Um, there's just, I think going through, if you do go through like the traditional, um, you know, computer science route, you're you probably come out an amazing developer. Um, but also, there's just so many good resources out there. Uh, it's a very like open source community like in the blockchain side of things but also in development overall so um, a lot of self teachings a lot of joining the right communities to kind of like what you were saying before join hackathons and everything to yeah. to kind of build up those skills yeah working on open source projects is like the how how most people get experience in blockchain yeah, yeah exactly all right uh so how for how long have you been in the blockchain space and what are you working on these days yeah um so for how long probably since uh the end of 2017 when there was like a big push in popularity back then um with with eth and and a lot of other you know blockchains um that's when i first started listening to some friends that were already in the space and um what i was interested in was like how it all worked and so that's where i first bought a few gpus and built my own mining rig um, yeah, so so I got in it actually more on that side. Um, so I was like joining pools to mine ETH, and then there were a lot of other like blockchains and stuff popping up. And then uh, over the past, and I, I, that was really nice because you could just let that run and go to work every day. Um, and then over the the past couple of years, I was a little bit more interested in the application layer. So that's when I started trying to pick up and, and develop my smart contract skills and my web dev skills, and and basically did kind of exactly what you said, jumped on a few open source projects, did a few hackathons. Um, today, what I do is I'm a community developer for a DeFi protocol called AirSwap. Um, 
they they're basically like a swapping platform uh but they do a slightly different thing than your traditional like i don't know if you could call it traditional yet but like your automated market makers they do kind of like requests for for quotes um and i work on some smart contract stuff for them uh i also do some advising work on on projects that are popping up because i have a background in the the node management and the, the mining side of things and then one thing that i'm doing right now that i've been able to connect with a uh, a few other good developers and actually artists is jumping this NFT space with um, with this project oh. that we're trying to basically push the NFTs a little bit further to mix the physical and the digital world together. So that's um, that's why I was figuring we could go through the the contract on uh, a little bit later and and uh, show what we're we're trying to accomplish with that. All right, yeah, that sounds great. Um, just like, can you give us a quick overview of? What kind of advice would you give to people who want to get into smart contract development? And what's like your plan for today to give people a nice introduction to that? Yeah, um, I think we definitely hit on the right points um, in terms of like, on, honestly, I don't even know if there's like college courses yet on smart contracts. Maybe there yeah, are. That's what we're working on. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Baf started courses in uh, a couple of schools. I'm I'm working with Baf awesome. right now to start a course at my school at University of Rochester, and it's really hard because yeah. it's hard to find professors to actually teach you this stuff. But yeah, I see most yeah. people are honestly self-taught. But I think I think what you're doing is is amazing because like now in school you probably learn like Python and and Java and JavaScript and all that kind of stuff, and and in a couple of years from now people will start. Uh, because of what you're doing, uh, have like Solidity courses that they can fall back on or, or like overall blockchain architecture. Um, but yeah, like today, um, I'd say it, it is really, it is a very open community. There's so many projects and ideas floating around and just not enough people to work on all of them. Um, so so if you're looking to just jump in the space, definitely, you know, go through a network like BAF, go through just searching for whichever hackathons are, are popping up. Um, go through actually a lot of open source projects um provide bounties on if you can do something as simple as maybe a tweak to their website to something yeah. a little bit more complicated as like uh you know some proxy contract but definitely like things there to to get started and and that's like the true the true learning experience um that you'll get it's very yeah like overall theme it's it's super open and, and you you just kind of jump in there and i'd say the only other thing i'd add to is um like it's a fast moving space as i'm sure you're well aware um yeah so i always feel like i'm catching up on everything and i think that's a, a totally normal feeling uh because there's just so much you know new things coming out new kind of standards that you should bring into i think like solidity went through you know three versions over the past year from like six seven now eight um so so uh so yeah, it's just it's one of those ones that you you want to kind of always be looking into what's happening, what's changing, working on little side activities to to kind of keep up with the times. And, and there's plenty of plenty of opportunities for that to happen too. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and it's it's a really exciting industry, and people shouldn't be discouraged because it's really good to be early in a space. Like, how are they going to hire a blockchain developer? there are no real blockchain experts. The space has been along for like a short period of time. So you can really, there's no, there isn't really that much pressure to be the perfect blockchain developer. Oh, yeah. And there are so many resources out there. And then if you join a protocol early, you could get like so many perks and like tokens or equity. So that's, that's what I like about blockchain. Anyway, so we don't have questions yet from the audience. So I think we should just get into the smart contracts review. Okay. Cool. Um, so I have it pulled up on my screen in VS Code. So maybe just best if I if I share that, right? Yeah. Do you have access? Yeah. Can you... Let me um, share screen two. Okay. So um, I guess before I jump into the details of this, I'll just give like a little bit of a background of 
what this actually does and what's the overall project about. Um, so, so this is what I was alluding to before in which we're, we're working on an NFT project that um, combines like digital assets and physical assets together. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit of the background of, of, of where this came from is I myself um, as a developer uh, connected with another uh, developer and friend of mine um, and we were both talking about like NFTs and why to understand, oh, it would be really interesting to, to create a project in this space because we both come more from kind of like the DeFi world. And as you know, there's many projects out there in the NFT space pushing really cool, uh, unique features. A lot of them though, focus just on like the digital aspect, whether it's like, you know, avatars or, or art pieces or whatever it might be. So what we wanted to do was like, add on to that. So definitely still have that, that, that really awesome art piece to it, but then combine it with like the physical side of things. Um, and, and so this, uh, the developer who's partnering with me on this, he's from Europe and his family heritage is actually, uh, Greek. And so he's really involved, um, in the olive oil, olive oil industry in Greece. And so we, we, uh, created this interesting project where we're combining like fine pieces of art with these like traditional bottles of extra virgin Greek olive oil. And so, wow. yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it's, um, it's been like really interesting uh, things so far uh, to, to go through the process of like figuring out one, like how does that even like work? What does that mean when you say you're gonna sell like olive oil as NFTs and like how, how does the market actually react to that? And, and how does it actually like uh, roll out? Um, just like some quick, quick facts on that. Um, we, we decided that we wanted to partner with basically a small, well, we partnered with artists because we wanted to create a, a small batch, like we're calling it a Genesis harvest. So we only have like, um, 10 bottles plus an 11th bonus bottle. So we have 11 artists that are working with us. Each one creates their own art piece. That'll be the digital NFT. Then that digital art piece will also be the label on the olive oil bottle. The olive oil bottle will also have a QR code that connects back to the smart contract that I'll, I'll go through in a second. Um, and the art has been created, but the olive oil harvest won't actually occur until October or November this year. And we're auctioning off the NFTs so that each uh, digital art piece gets auctioned off and has an owner before the harvest occurs. And then when the harvest occurs, then that owner gets the bottle. We've already auctioned off two NFTs, which both sold for auction which is awesome oh wow um, yeah and then we have a third one that that's going on right now that already has a few bids on it and we're doing we're doing a, a continual auction like every five days so that'll go until early october um so so well, it's pretty I, I never heard of something like that i love how like industries are intertwining and it's just like blockchain and olive oil really. yeah and i think the the other thing to add to this one too is like there's definitely, there's definitely like a few different, um, kind of like you were saying, like industries intertwining. Like I, I was interested a few years ago in how blockchain was supporting supply chain mechanisms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like there was origin trail and, and, and V chain and a bunch of other projects that they're still around and still doing great work and, and were around back then. And so that was a big part too of like, oh, they all use kind of the general ERC 20 standard um like when they when they start off it'd be really interesting to understand how we could use non-fungible tokens to also like support that kind of supply chain mechanism because what, what we're doing is on top of the art on top of the general olive oil we're working with a local producer for the oil and basically cutting down her supply chain of instead of having to go from like her farm to the mill to the local distributor that goes to like a wholesale international distributor back to another local distributor somewhere to a grocery store yeah. It's basically like streamlining from from farm to to NFT owner, um, so it's it's kind of cool how how we're you know bringing all those different dynamics together with this. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, that's kind of like the the high level piece, and how that actually works in in reality is a few uh functions that we've added to this contract which is a a general erc 721 contract from from open zeppelin um 
just to maybe give like a an overview on that uh, on the ERC 721 standard. So it's for the the non fungible tokens uh, in which you deploy the the contract and then you can create a token that is definitely like its own thing uh, compared to the next token you create from that smart contract. So this is why like each token that's created represents a an art piece and an individual bottle of, of olive oil aligned with that. Um, so that's kind of what we're 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 basing our contract on top of. Um, and then what we're doing is adding in, I call it supply chain components. Um, it'll be interesting to kind of see and, and hear what what people uh, react to this as and have questions on. Um, but but we add in a few additional components that that help push the um, I guess like the human interaction of being able to send uh, the NFT owner being able to send via signed message their uh, shipping details, us being able to collect that with the signed message to prove it to them, and then also um, being able to, uh, with the physical asset by scanning a QR code on it, hitting another function on this smart contract that will confirm delivery of the asset, which can then in turn um, unlock you know additional metadata. Um, for example, in, in this case, it's going to unlock an a additional video on the metadata. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll kind of jump through this, uh, probably line by line, but before I do, I just want to double check if there's any kind of initial questions on, on the overall project or anything that I just said, um, or, or anything like that. Otherwise I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, there's a Q and A section, or you could just drop it in the chat and I'll share it with Martin. Okay. Um, so yeah, going going through this, um, what what we're calling this this base contract is we're calling it a, a lockable token. So that's that's what we're um, that's what we're creating um, and adding on to. And then later, what we're going to do at the end of this is I just called this like a digital token, but you could call it ITC, which is the name of the project or whatever. What we actually deploy at the end. Um, and it deploys like the constructor of the lockable token. Um, but going into the lockable token, so we're using uh, from Open Zeppelin um, basically a library called Counters, which is very uh, convenient because it makes it so that anytime you mint a NFT token from your smart contract, it just automatically updates um, the counter for for what that that contract's token ID is. So if you just leave it kind of as default as we have here. Uh, the counter starts at zero, and then once you mint, uh, the counter will increase by one. So then the next token ID will be one, and then two, and three, and four, and five, and like so on, like that. Um, I think that's a pretty nice um, utility from from Open Zeppelin, and it just kind of makes it uh, really easy to to get this thing started outside the out of the box. Um, so going into uh, these mappings that we have here, this is. This is an interesting piece because, as I mentioned, we're kind of mixing in a supply chain component to, to combine that physical and digital piece. What that means for us is that with each token, um, we mint it and it automatically just has a piece of art like associated with it um, through its metadata. What yeah. happens is... Um, we know that in the future, we're going to send whoever the owner of that token is, like this bottle of olive oil. Um, and that's going to occur in October or November. And what can what can happen between like, you know, when the NFT is auctioned and goes to the first NFT holder up until the harvest is it can definitely be like transferred. You know, they could resell it if they want. They could send it to another wallet. They can do whatever they want with that NFT. Um, but what we want to happen is when the harvest occurs and the olive oil is ready, we want it to just kind of stay with one person so that we can ship it to them because we don't want to ship it to someone. And then in the interim, they like send the NFT to, to another address or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because then it'll be a mismatch between like the, where the olive, olive oil bottle goes and where the NFT goes. So what we actually did in this case is we set up a mechanism in which at a specific date, uh, the transfer mechanism in the in the NFT token will actually lock 
And the only way it can be unlocked is by scanning that QR code that's on the olive oil bottle, which calls a function to unlock it. So that way it like ensures that on, and, and what we do in, in this use case is like, it's gonna be October 15th. Um, we mint a token that has a timestamp for October 15th, 2021. That day that token transferability will lock. Then we'll be able to, to get the shipping details, send the olive oil bottle. The NFT owner gets that bottle, scans the QR code, unlocks it. They can like, I don't know, cook with the olive oil or drink it or do whatever they want with it. And then they, they'll be able to, because they've unlocked the token, be able to transfer it again wherever they want. Um, so I think that was like an important piece to explain. I'm happy to like clarify if there's any questions, but that's also where, where some of these things come into play. Um, so, so yeah, maybe just to, to go, go through each one of those, this, this mapping here is the, the token lock from timestamp. So what we'll see, uh, when, when you mint a token is that each token ID, uh, which is a unit here, unsigned integer, um, uh, is mapped to a specific, uh, other unsigned integer, which is a UNX time stamp. Uh, for in this case representing October 15th. So that's going to be um, part of the, the minting process where you take the ID, you put in the timestamp, and then it just knows that once that timestamp occurs, the, the transfer function locks. Um, what this next mapping is, is a unlock hash code. So every time you actually mint that same token, you're putting in the timestamp, but you're also putting in basically like the password that would be needed to unlock um, that token again in the future. And that, that password is actually like um, double hashed. So it, there's a hashed version here, um, but that 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 uh, unlock hash code is actually what's in the QR code on the bottle of olive oil. Uh, and then this here is just a simple bool, booling, saying like if the token's unlocked or, or not unlocked. And, and so that's that also gets triggered like basically after, after a, after the timestamp has occurred, um, the this will say like whether it's been locked or unlocked, um, and prevent or allow the token to be transferred. Um, so, yeah, this is just the base token URI. So you you basically set this to, you know, if it's a thc dot art slash metadata or if it's whatever your own personal website is, it's it's kind of like the base URL. For where your your metadata will will reside, or if it's a like some IPFS gateway, whatever it might be. Um, this is just a a custom event that we created for when a token is unlocked, meaning that the bottle has been received and successfully unlocked by the token owner. This gets shot out into the events, which is logged um, in the logs of the blockchain, so that everyone will always know that this this uh, physical asset has been uh, received. And then you can also use that if you're like want to update the metadata on your back end to to like I don't know throw a throw out a, a new like updated video additional unlockable content whatever it might be um, yeah so that was all the fun mapping and variables and everything set and then the constructor uh, very typical to a to a NFC to a ERC721 you have your name you have your symbol and you have your your token URI so, so that's that's all basically set. You set your 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 token URI to um, to the to the base URI variable, um, and then we have a few uh, functions within the within the contract here. Um, so I think I'll I'll start with with actually not not go in the order here, but go start with the mint function first. Because this is where um, normally, if you're like to mint an ERC721, uh, you just put in like the address that you want to mint it to, and then you either pass in uh, the token ID or you have like the logic somewhere in here for it. Actually, this is the mint function right here that's doing exactly that. You mint the address that the token is going to go to, and then the token ID. Um, what we've done here is when you mint, you pass in the address of where it's going to go to. You pass in the timestamp in which it should lock after, which for us is October 15th, 2021. And then you pass in the unlock hash, which is like that password that uh, will unlock the token transferability once it locks in the future. Um, so, so this is setting up that, that mapping that I was showing before. 
where you get to um, have the, the current token ID. So it starts with zero and it goes like one, two, three every time, um, sets the mapping to the timestamp, um, then sets the other mapping to have the specific unlock hash for that timestamp. Um, and then it goes through the mint process that comes from the ERC721 standard from Open Zeppelin. And then you increment um, your token IDs, which is from that utility library from Open Zeppelin. So, so you mint it, and then the uh, the NFT is just like out there on the blockchain, um, existing. And so, what you could do if you want to interact with it directly is there's a few of these other functions. Like you could always just find what's the base URI, which is in our case like a thc.art.metadata. You could find the specific URI for 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 a token that exists by passing in the token ID. So if it was zero, then it would be like that base URI plus zero dot JSON, which is what this is kind of saying here, token ID plus JSON. And then that'll spit out uh, the metadata that you can easily find up on, on the internet. Uh, and then this is just support interface. This is a, a handy way for other contracts to tell if you're A721, which fun fact, um, this is really, really awesome uh, to differentiate between 721 contracts and other contracts that might exist, like 1155s, um, also ERC-20s. This wasn't around for a really long time, so there's a lot of ERC-20s, and I still don't think it's even a standard, that don't have this like support interface. So it's really hard if you want to know if an ERC-20 is actually ERC-20, other than having access to the contract ABI yourself or or just trying to uh, do a transfer call on that and, and hoping that it's, uh, it is what it is. Um, yeah, so so those, those were kind of like the, the generic functions. This was the mint function. Um, let's say that this is now October uh, 16th, 2021. You have your NFT. Um, you maybe like sold it a few times and, and the harvest is about to begin. And like you're the current owner of that NFT. If you were to try and transfer it like after the, the timestamp, then this is actually a function that's part of the ERC721 standard from Open Zeppelin called before transfer, um, where we've basically uh, overridden it so that it before the transfer event, it does a check to see if the token timestamp in that mapping is ahead of the uh, current block timestamp. So this will say like, um, this will say like, okay, token, uh, yeah, this, this is, this is the 15th and, and today's the 16th. And then this here will be the boolean that I mentioned before, um, of whether it's, uh, locked or unlocked. And so if any of those, uh, return, uh, basically true, then it says like, Hey, tokens locked um you cannot go forward with this i mean if any of these return false should i say then then it says like tokens locked and you can't transfer it so you basically have to hold on to that token uh provide your shipping details to the the project team they send you the the bottle of olive oil and then um and then they uh go ahead and and then as the owner you you can have that bottle of oil olive oil or or asset whatever it might be scan it and then unlock the token and get your unlockable content um this next one here, this is the unlock token function. So this is where you uh, pass through the the unlock hash, like the password hash, basically, and the appropriate token ID. Um, and so what this does is it makes sure one that you're the owner of that that NFT, um, and then two, it goes ahead and um, uh, unlocks or it basically hashes the uh, the unlock hash uh, to make sure that it matches um, the the hash that was originally put in uh, as part of the mapping. Uh, it makes sure that um, this hashed unlock hash matches this, which was put in at the beginning, as it, which is kind of like a security step, uh, meaning that you're not just putting in like, if you originally put in password as like, you know, the, 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 I guess, bytes that go into the, the minting, um, someone could just kind of like 
maybe put that in as well. This is really saying that um, you're not sending the same hash out twice, one through the minting uh, process and then one through like the bottle. There has to be, what, what's put in first is a hashed version of some other password that you actually never reveal until providing it through the, the QR code on the bottle. So there's, so it's not out there um, in any domain for anyone to see until it gets shipped with the bottle. Um, then you say token unlock is, is true, so it's unlocked. And then you admit that the token has been unlocked, which is basically admitting that the, the bottle or asset has been received. Um, and that's really like the main functions and functionality to this thing. Um, what we've done here is just kind of call uh, this lockable token and, and just put in another contract that you could call like digital token and, and you know, the symbol and, and set up the, the URI to, to whatever you want here. Um, I have a couple of tests that I can also run if people are interested to kind of see like a little bit more of, you know, those functions in action. Um, also happy to, you know, answer any questions that, that anyone has in the meantime. So I know I'll just kind of pause there, one to catch my breath and then two to, to see if anyone has anything to say. Yeah, thanks Mark. That was so interesting. And uh, we do have three questions. Uh, the first one is from Moses J. Consulted me on a Jetty design. I gave an option of a design in a project that would both have digital and physical projects, just like the olive oil NFTs idea, but this time architecture and NFT. Yeah. No, I think I think that's awesome. Um, so I've just been like talking about olive oil nonstop, but <laughs> since I since I uh, like. Uh, kind of let people know that this is what I've worked on or have been working on. Um, there's been some really interesting and awesome people that have reached out to myself. And also I've just seen like a lot of ideas going out there. Um, so kind of building on, you know, on, on that piece there, uh, there's been people who have reached out with like actual like physical art pieces. Like one person uh, works with metal and just makes these really cool sculptures. And so, um, we were discussing with with him and he was also kind of running his own project of of how to how to include that as well as long as there's like some kind of uh way that you are allowing the person to call the function back on the smart contract on the physical thing for us it was easy enough just to put a qr code on the bottle label uh for other assets you can like etch in a qr code or maybe you can etch in like the 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 hash that i was just talking about before we've also spoken with uh people coming from other industries including uh, coffee makers, uh, like coffee farmers in Colombia, uh, people who make wine, who own vineyards, uh, interesting person, uh, from Australia, as well as another person from, um, from New York, New Jersey area. Uh, we've had people reach out to us from luxury brands. Um, one of the, one of the artists on here, um, is actually his, his auction is going to start up next week. He, he's an artist who's done work for uh, this brand that I'm totally going to butcher the name, Balenciaga or something like that, Balenciaga, I don't know. Um, so so there's a lot of like kind of meshing of this kind of like craft goods with also luxury uh, items because um, you could potentially, um, you know, provide a hat or a dress or sunglasses or something like that that also has a digital component to it. Maybe it's like a video of the production of that that specific like art piece or or, or luxury item. Uh, I think the the most the, the coolest one of someone who's reached out to me so far has been a person who makes custom skateboards in Canada, um, uh, and talking about how to potentially use this as well because uh, they'd like when they create their custom skateboards, um, they have the graphics as well. Um, so how they could create the custom skateboard with the graphics as a digital file, but then also uh, the skateboard itself, which is the physical item and being able to, to connect the two. So, you know, architecture and, and, uh, yeah. digital assets, there's, there's just like so many possibilities. Um, and one thing I'll add to is what we've done in our project is we've, we've wrote a few different medium articles as well. So I know that the, the, uh, our project website has been shared here. If you look in the top right corner, there's a link to Medium, and then you could actually see like a bit of what we've done. Like we have some very deep technical uh, 
like articles kind of going through what I just went through with the smart contract. And then we have ones that are a little bit more like higher level on, on the overall project architecture. So you could definitely look at that too. Yeah. I think the advantage of blockchain of having access to the same information and reducing the communication errors can be a game changer for many industries and also reducing costs by enabling the effective audit of supply chain data. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, more questions. What happens to the NFT when the digital, when the physical asset is destructed or altered? Yeah, I'd say like that's that's actually um, like that's something that I've been thinking about a lot as well. Of is this where you're cloning like you know a one for one of the digital and the physical? Um, the more that we've gone through this project and this process. Um, the more my thinking is definitely like, I don't know if I could say matured or just like, I don't know, even gone down a rabbit hole or whatever it might be. But I think the one thing that's interesting about NFTs and the whole digital component is that it's not necessarily creating a physical piece to it. Um, what it's doing is, I mean, it's not necessarily creating a digital piece that aligns one for one with a physical piece. Um, it's, it's kind of capturing uh, that that physical event happened and persisting it digitally. And what I mean by that is similar to, you know, when you take a picture of an event and you put it on like Facebook or Instagram or something like that, like that, that thing happened a moment in time. What you're doing now with this, mm -hmm. this kind of like digital image of that is yeah. you're, you're persisting it continually. So it doesn't matter that the physical piece is, is over it. It's still there. Um, and then to, to add even further onto that, um, I think the, the digital piece makes it so that, well, well, yeah, taking a step back, the artists, what they're creating is they're not like, we didn't just take pictures of olive bottles and put them as NFTs. We partnered with these artists so that each of them coming from like a different part of the world, a different perspective, a different style, um, but different medium, everything they, they're creating pieces that represent their their perspective of this olive yeah. harvest, like traditional harvest. And then that's what's being captured. And then turning that into an NFT and someone buying it is actually enabling this like event. Yeah. To occur. And so it's really kind of like connecting everything together in a in like a full event. And then in a hundred years from now, you know, if the ETH blockchain is still running, um, people can go and see like this actually happened, this kind of physical transfer occurred because the token's been unlocked. But then they'll actually, they'll actually also see uh, through the perspective of like an artist, through the the human cultural perspective of like yeah. what actually meant to someone. So it's it's much like deeper, I think, than than just you know this is number three bottle um, sort of thing. So I don't know. I'd really like to get Nora like your thoughts on that. It's too. a very it's a very good question because it's most people just like jump on NFT trends and don't really think about it conceptually and how like you're tokenizing, as you said, the perspective of the creator, the time and the energy that they put into the work. And then it's also useful for like documenting transactions, as you said. Um, but it's definitely, the concept definitely has to be more challenged. Like what can you tokenize and what do you have the right to tokenize? Like we see people tokenizing memes and things. And there are many questions around that. Um, but I think it's a very good question and your answer was pretty good. Yeah. I'll add, um, I'll add just like one more thing to that actually, uh, that, that I was looking into the other day, uh, when I was really like thinking about this, like, I think we're all probably familiar with UNESCO world heritage sites. Yeah. Uh, they're just, you know, all over the place. They're all physical places in the world. Um, one thing that UNESCO did, and th this is not related to blockchain or anything at all. But one thing that they did uh, starting a few years ago is they actually created uh, digital versions of all their World Heritage sites. Um, and like one of the main reasons being is that, you know, we all know that it's it's really hard to to keep these places from from degrading over time, like whether it's like physical, like just environmental stuff or human stuff or whatever it might be. But kind of by digitizing it, they're 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 kind of admitting like that, that, that kind of like, you know, over time, 
the physical stuff will just not always be there. Um, but by creating like that digital piece, it just goes back to the fact that that you're you're finding a way to like encapsulate it and then like persist it. Um, I think that this goes what we're doing is like something very similar, but yeah. then also with blockchain being able to to you know decentralize it and, and make it open for everyone. Yep. Yeah, that's that sounds right. Um, we have ten minutes left, so I want to go through all the questions. What are the plans for this after the ten bottles have been shipped? This is an amazing idea with the right scalability for any corporation. Yeah. So I think um, for for us, this is definitely the the you know the proof of concept, seeing if like operation wise we could actually make it work, and then also seeing if there's a market for it. And and kind of on the initial results, I think like both of those are a yes. Uh, we're really happy that that people are, are jumping on this, um, finding like like additional value in, in the NFTs. And so kind of what I was alluding to before is we've had really cool, interesting conversations with many producers. And so now we're looking into um, what's the, the right step forward after this. We've actually also talked to Marketplace, which I don't think I should say, um, about integrating this into their kind of protocol so yeah. we have like multiple ways to to go forward with this if we want to integrate this into existing nft marketplaces if we want to uh even create our own platform that's that focuses exclusively on on this sort of stuff um but but i'd say like the these first these first bottles are, are definitely the genesis harvest and and those that are jumping in on this are, are really kind of same as you know anyone that jumps in on on any any other project, whether it's like DeFi or, or whatever, like they're the early adopters, and and um, and so we're we're super happy and, and grateful for those people, and and we'll definitely find like ways to to bring them along in the future. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. Uh, yeah. Someone asked, was the coffee project a collaboration with the Simma chain by any chance? No, it it wasn't. Um, it was actually a just an independent coffee producer who who heard of this, uh, who was actually interested from the NFT perspective. But I've also seen over the years a, a few other coffee projects. And so I, I definitely know there's a lot of work being done in there too. Yeah. Cool. And someone missed the part when you talked about the number of bottles you've sold. So can you sh share like your journey and how, how many bottles you've been selling? Yeah. Um, so if you go on, if you go on, either OpenSea or, or Rare, Rareables where we're holding the auctions, um, rarable.com slash FTC-NFT. That's our collection page. And so we've sold two because uh, we just started the auctions last week um, and we hold a auction every day. So we've successfully sold two. We have one currently going for auction, which has two bids on it already. And then we're going to have another one starting on Saturday. And so this is going to go um, all the way up until we have 10 bottles or 10 NFTs total, then a bonus 11th one. Um, so there's going to be 11 total until the first week of October because it's five days um, as an as a auction there. And then um, come October 15th, that's when the tokens will lock. So whoever has it in their wallets at that point will then be able to pass their shipping details um, through our website, which has a shipping page that sends the, the signed transaction. And then also we'll, we're going to uh, release like the other functionality on the website to, to unlock the token and everything. Um, and another, another piece is we have the schedule in our discord as well. Um, so I think I could probably right. share, share the, the links here as well for that. If, if it would be great to have your discord. Yeah. Let me pull that up. Um, all right. I'm going to drop this link in the chat, which is a link tree. Um, and then with this, it has the links to one, the ongoing auction, um, Rarible, a few media and publication pieces. And then at the bottom, uh, the link to our website, to our Discord, and, and social channels. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we went through all the questions. 
Um, I think it would be nice to wrap this up by telling us just at what moment you decided you want to pursue blockchain um, and why. Yeah, I think um, for the for for quite a few years, it was definitely something that I was interested in on nights and weekends. Um, and those nights and weekends just started turning more into like during the day sort of thing. And, and so it, it got to the point where um, I think now like the overall community is very, very mature. And, and what I was saying before is that there's so much demand um, than there is even supply of people that are, are knowledgeable in the space. And when I say knowledgeable, it's like, it's not knowledgeable like you're an expert with like 10 years because actually no one has that. It's too early for that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's like that you, you actually show an interest in that you're motivated. And so I, I, I really decided like a, a few months ago um, to to uh, to really go ahead and, and start pursuing this more full time, get serious about some of those open source projects I was working on and um, and and start working more full time on, on a lot of these like project at DC and, and other pieces. So I think right now is a, a really a really good time for people to build up their knowledge, jump on a few open source projects and then um, have the ability to, to jump in full time, whether you want to start your own project with a group of people or whether you want to join an existing um, ongoing startup or project. Yeah, I think that must be very inspiring to people who attended today. Thank you guys for coming. Um, the smart contract review was also very interesting. And if, if you guys want to delve deeper, we have a Web3 course uh, that we actually finished recently and we'll be running more of those. Um, and I think it's just, it's really nice to learn more about these new technologies that are disrupting so many industries like olive oil, who, who would think of that? So yeah, thank you so much, Martin. This was great. And I just, I want to uh, tell you guys again that if you want to be involved and actually learn, the best way to learn is by doing. So signing up for the MetaBuild uh, hackathon that is coming up this Friday is would be very useful. And there's going to be some learning material too and workshops. So definitely check that out. And I'll drop it in, in the chat one more time. And we can now move on to the networking part. And just a few et etiquette um, remarks. Just try to be nice. Don't interrupt people. Don't dominate the conversation. And it's really just a chill time to get to know the people who attended the event. So if you guys want to stick around for that, that would be great. Oh, final question. How do you onboard new artists or partners with um, individual artists? I don't know what Moses means by that. Um, I think it's we, we also we have on, on our website under the artist section about um, people I want to partner with us because oh. when, yeah, when we started the project, it was, it was really like, I had done a few NFT hackathons before. And so I, I was finding people there, but also like kind of shouting out for people to join. We definitely are interested in more artists and people joining our community just so, you know, if at, once this Genesis harvest is over and, and future things occur, um, we'll have the right people to work with. So if you are an artist, join join our community reach reach out to me everyone has like you know my my contact through the through the website um and, and we could definitely take it from there yeah cool all right i think we went through all the questions that was great thank you so much martin and thanks for taking the time to share this with us today i'm sure many of our members are super passionate about nfts and would like to learn more about how to actually create them yeah. um all right, we can now move to the networking part. Thank you guys. Bye.